morning after her spine surgery this past Friday, and she's heading home already today. Uh, so that's a tremendous blessing and a praise, and so thank you uh, on her behalf for your prayers. I also got a, um, uh, an urgent prayer request this morning. Uh, if you get our emails, you probably received it. Um, there is a two-week-year-old little girl named Stella Matheson um, who was born two weeks ago again, like I said, um, and she was born with Down syndrome, and she's got some heart troubles, three heart defects that they have uh, determined, and um, she needs surgery, uh, but she's not able to have that surgery yet until she gains some weight. And so um, the time frame that they're looking uh, at, it looks like they're hoping that she'll gain the weight that she needs uh, by October. Um, but I'll keep you up to date as I learn more about that. I just learned about that this morning. But if you will, church, keep little Stella Matheson in your prayers. Uh, I've also got a letter to read to you. This is specifically to the kids, uh, but you can listen to it uh, as well. This comes from First Baptist Church. It says this, it says, hi kids, this is a big thank you to the children who donated hygiene items to the backdoor ministry while at kids camp. Uh, with your help, we can provide hygiene items that are so needed to the homeless and needy in the community. Uh, may God bless each of you, Glenda Rose. And so thank you kids for your work uh, and for you leaders for putting that together while y'all were out at kids camp this summer. And, um, and First Baptist thanks you as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for worship. God, we're thankful that we've got a place to come to, Lord, where we can come and where we can hear your word preached, uh, where we can gather, Lord, to sing these songs that we so love, Lord, that, that honor and glorify and magnify you, Lord. Father, we're thankful for one another. And God, that you have uh, given us, that you've called us out of darkness and into a marvelous light, and that we've got, we've got one another that we can lean on during hard times. Uh, that we've got folks that you have placed in our lives, Lord, that as we mourn, they can mourn with us. As we weep, uh, they can weep with us, Lord. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the salvation that we enjoy because of what Christ has done at Calvary. God, because of what you've done for us, Lord, we, we, have, we can do nothing else but come together and worship. And so, Father, we just pray, God, this morning that as we prepare, Father, that you would prepare us, that our hearts... Uh, Father, would be in the right position this morning. Lord, that our minds would be open to what you have for us in your word. Father, use the songs that we sing this morning, the, the lyrics to these songs, Lord, to impress truth upon our hearts. Father, many of us are in, in tough places right now. We've got tough things going on, God, because we live in a tough world. But God, we know that we serve a mighty Savior who is worthy of our worship, who is worthy of our praise, who is worthy of our adoration. And so, Father, we just ask, God, that as we step into this worship this morning, God, that you would prepare us and that you would use this and that spirit that you would work in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Miss Jean's going to, you were already here. Miss Jean's going to come and she's going to lead our choir this morning.
good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well. I get such mixed signals. Some of y'all are waving fans. Some of y'all are putting coats on. And I mean, I know I'm hot, so I'm with the all waving fans. Uh, but I got a handful of announcements for you this morning. If you've got a bulletin, you can open up to the middle. Um, some of these are for months away. Some of these are for this week. Um, so just to get you in the know about some different things going on. Uh, one, if you haven't been coming to our Wednesday evening services, or if you're uh, kind of new and you're still trying to figure out what all we have going on, our regular Wednesday evening services are all start at 6.15. Um, at 6.15 for the adults, uh, it's prayer meeting, and then at 6.45-ish, you have a Bible study. Um, but at 6.15, the students have something going on. We're going through a book right now. Well, kind of. We're going through a book when school starts back. Right now, we're kind of on a weird limbo. Um, but then the kids have stuff going on during the summertime. Um, and Awana's for the children resumes September 15th. Uh, if you have any questions about that or want to get any more information that day, you can talk to Taryn. Um, and get all of that uh, good stuff going on. And if you are coming to the uh, Wednesday evening Bible studies, the text is there in the, um, in the bulletin going through Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Uh, second thing I have for you, um, September 5th, after service, um, we're making plans uh, to everybody kind of individually go and make a point to pray at one of our schools or multiple schools. Um, there are five elementary schools in the area, and then you have more Clements and then Prince George High School and then, I can't even remember the name of the, what's the tech school's name? Rowani. Rowani. I don't know why I can never remember that. Uh, but Rowani is, is an option too. Um, so just make plans that uh, September 5th, not go straight to lunch or not go straight home and change. Um, but make a point and go pray for the schools, pray for the students, for the teachers, the administration, all the staff and everything. Um, they're not going to have another normal year. This is still something crazy. It's going, still messing with the schools. Um, so just be praying for them and the different things going on with all of that. Uh, third thing I have for you, uh, September 11th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., we're going to have a Kahuki Family Day. So just come hang out, uh, have a good time, do some fishing, do some talking, do a lot of talking, um, probably eat some good food and all that good stuff. Um, fifth thing that I have for you is just a reminder, October 31st through November 3rd, um, the Life Action Ministry Silver Team will be here to run our revival services That'll start Sunday morning on October 31st and run through Wednesday evening, November 3rd. Um, if you have any questions about that, please come and contact me. I'm the one with all the answers to the questions. Um, and be on the, uh, be praying through and thinking of the different ways that you can help us um, bring the team in. Uh, we're going to have some different areas that you guys get the ability to serve. Like uh, they stay in host homes, so you're going to be able to keep some of them for the week and um, get to know them better in that capacity. Uh, they'll need cars donated for the week and all of that good stuff too. Um, but like I said, we'll be giving out more information as we're getting a little bit closer to that. Um, final thing, if you flip to the back of the bulletin, uh, this is for the students. Uh, we do have Sunday night get right tonight, um, as we talked about this morning. Just bring tennis shoes every week, like always. Sorry, I had to get on somebody. Um, and then a reminder, Friday, August 27th, that's this Friday. Yep. It's this Friday. Um, we're going to be redoing the youth room, um, doing some, uh, some work to it. Uh, we're going to be painting and all, doing all of that good stuff, getting that prepped. So if you would like to come and help us with that, guys, um, we would, student, different students, we would love to have you there. Um, we're going to have donuts there for breakfast. So if you need more than a donut for breakfast, you should eat before you come. Uh, but we will have lunch there, um, and hopefully it won't take too much longer after that to get it all knocked out. Um, and so just come hang, hang out, have a good time, get some work done. And then the following day, Saturday, August 28th, from 4 to 8 p.m., we're going to have our back-to-school uh, back school party. We're going to have some popcorn, some pizza, have a good time, watch a movie, play some games. Um, so come out, hang out, have a good time um, with all of that good stuff. I believe that's all of the announcements that I have for us this morning. Flip through one more time to make sure. Yeah, so that's everything I have in the bulletin. If I forgot something, we'll get it at the end of service. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you are a good, good father. So God, this morning as, as we come before you, um, let us focus on you. Let the only thing that is captivating our attention be you. Let the words that are coming out of our mouths through these songs, let it be worship to you and to you alone. Let's not think about the person to our left or to our right or in front of us or on the screen. But God, let you alone be the focus of our worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'd stand with us, we're going to sing all four verses of hymn number 406, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. I dare not 
trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he that is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Oh, Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Uh, take a moment to greet one another. Well, amen. We're going to take a minute to sing uh, the first two verses of How Great Is Our God. Oh, 
today. I just pray that you will help us each to know and understand how great you are. You are a great, great God, just as we sing. And Lord, as we take this time to give our offerings to you, we know that they are important to further your work in this world. And I just pray that Everything will be used for your honor and your glory. But, Lord, we've got more to offer than money. We have the most valuable thing to offer, our time. And, Lord, I just pray that all of us will use our time wisely, that we will use it to glorify you. And I just pray that each one of us will know and understand that we need to be serving you all the time. You are a good, good, great God, and we thank you for that in your Son, Jesus Christ. And I ask this all now in his precious name. Amen. Uh, this time, Butcher's going to come read scripture for us. Today's scripture is going to be from Psalm 119, verses 28 through 48. I'm weary from grief. Strengthen me through your word. Keep me from the way of deceit and graciously give me your instruction. I have chosen the way of truth. I have set your ordinances before me. I cling to your decrees. Lord, do not put me to shame. I pursue the way of your commands for you broaden my understanding. 
Teach me, Lord, the meaning of your statutes, and I will always keep them. Help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Help me to stay on the path of your commands, for I take pleasure in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to material gain. Turn my eyes from looking at what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Confirm what you said to your servant, for it produces reverence for you. Turn away the great disgrace I dread. Indeed, your judgments are good. How I long for your precepts. Give me life through your righteousness. Let your faithful love come to me, Lord, your salvation as you promised. Then I can answer the one who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take the word of truth from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. I will always keep your law forever and ever. I will walk freely in an open place because I seek your precepts. I will speak of your decrees before kings and not be ashamed. I delight in your commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and, I, and will meditate on your statutes. You ain't kidding. Either that or a smaller stomach, one of the two. Whew. Uh, if you guys would stand with us one more time. <coughs> hey, do me a favor. Pull my sleeve. Okay. There we go. I think I got it. I'm going to start taking this jacket off before I do this because this is weird. Okay, I think I got it. I got a rope in the back of my thing holding this thing, and it's all over the place. Okay, we're good. There we go. Uh, we're going to sing through uh, Agnes Day. Um, yep, I was going to say something. I'm not. All right. <laughs>
never go a moment without recognizing your holiness. God, let us see what our sin so clearly is before our holy God that that we were stained. That there was nothing good in us, that there was nothing worthy to be saved, but God, that you loved us and that you sent your son to die for us. God, let your holiness be what pushes us through everything. Let your holiness be what pushes us towards Scripture. Let your holiness be what pushes us away from sin. God, let us run to you with everything within us because we're looking at Jesus Christ on the cross. That he took the place for me that I can come into your presence. God, you are holy. Holy, holy. And you are worthy of every breath that we breathe. So God, right now as we have this time that we've dedicated to you, let you and you alone, the one who is worthy, be the only focus that we have right now. Let us give you the glory and the honor and praise. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you've got your Bibles this morning, let me invite you to turn to John chapter 11. And we're going to be in verses 38 to 44 this morning. For those of you that use the Pew Bibles, I decided to do something really uh, neat that I learned from someone else this morning. I grabbed one of the pew Bibles, looked to see what page it was on so I could help you out a bit. And then I plumb forgot what the number was when I was walking up here this morning. <laughs> Off to a good start, aren't we? Um, on the first Sunday of last year, first Sunday of 2020, January the 5th, I preached our first sermon in the Gospel of John. And I've kicked myself ever since because I began in John chapter 3 which sounded like a, seemed to me like a, a good idea at first. Jimmy, can you, uh, or I'm sorry, um, Bucky, can you mute the, uh, the floor monitors, please? And it seemed like a good idea to me anyways to preach, to start in John chapter 3. Uh, and just so you know, I have kicked myself ever since. And so once we finish this, once we come to the final chapter of John, um, I don't think my conscience is going to let me not go back and preach chapters 1 and 2, so just heads up, uh, we'll be doing that. The sermon that I preached on that Sunday morning, January the 5th, 2020, I went back and read it this week, uh, and I titled it, You Must. Uh, And the three points that I pulled from that text that morning were, uh, uh, and they were all uh, started with the new birth. Um, Jesus says there you must be born again, not you have the option to be born again, like uh, you can be a Christian, but you can't be born again. No, you must be born again, Jesus says. And so the three points from that morning are are the new birth is necessary, Uh, the new birth is a supernatural work of God, and that the new birth is revealed by its effects. And so we come this morning to complete uh, what is common called the first half of the book of John. Now, that's not you took the uh, half of it and you split it down the middle verse-wise. The first half of John's gospel, many of you are probably aware of this already, it's known as the book of signs. The first half of John's gospel, it really centers on, on the seven miracles that are the signs that Jesus performed, that the signs that Jesus is God. The number seven, as you might also be familiar, is um, it, biblically it represents completion. 
And so it's fitting that this particular miracle, which we've been working ourselves up to the past several weeks, that it completes John's record of signs. Jesus' first miracle, you remember, which is the one that we skipped over uh, because I started in chapter 3, is where Jesus turns the water into wine. Doing so symbolized his power uh, to give life. His seventh miracle, which is the one that we're getting to this morning, it's in chapter 11, and it symbolizes Jesus' power over death. And we all know the story. Lazarus had become ill. His sisters, Mary and Martha, they had summoned Jesus. But when Jesus arrives, his friend was already dead. And so he speaks separately, as we've looked at over the last few weeks. He speaks separately with Mary uh, and with Martha. And we learned a lot over the past several weeks about those two women and what it looks like to, to have faith in Christ. And, and as he drew near the tomb, we, as we talked about two weeks ago, Israel preached last week, the week before that, uh, we discussed the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And as he got to the tomb, it tells us that Jesus was deeply moved again, as we're told in verse 38. And so to get the proper context, again, uh, to, to remind ourselves of some things that we discussed over the last few weeks, remember what we spoke of the last time we were in this chapter. That when it says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit in verse 33, uh, some of your translations will say uh, he groaned in the spirit. And again, here in verse 38, it says the same. You know, perhaps a better translation there uh, for us to better understand what Jesus is feeling is that word in indignation. Jesus was, Jesus was angry. He was feeling indignation. Another translation there involves uh, snorting with anger. Jesus doesn't come to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, uh, like Piglet on Winnie the Pooh, does he? He doesn't come up there and go, oh, dear. He, that's not what he does, is it? He, he, he's angry, and as I presented to you two weeks ago, the reason that Jesus was angry, the reason that he's mad, feeling indignation, yes, he loved his friend, that was part of the reason of it, but the real reason that Jesus is feeling indignation at that point is death itself. And you'll notice there's not a lot of talking going on once Jesus gets to the tomb. There could have been, but, but John apparently doesn't think it's important enough to mention. Jesus gets there and he says, verse 39, take away the stone. I love what Dutch theologian Herman Ritterboss says in his commentary about this. He says, enough. He says, enough now of tears and wailing. Enough honor has been bestowed on death. Against the power of death, God's glory will now enter the arena. If that doesn't get you pumped up, I don't know what will. It says, death, you're done. You can pack your mess and you can get out of here. Death, you don't live here anymore. And Martha turns around and says, Lord, this is the L-E-E -E translation here. This is not your KJV, your ESV, your NASB. Martha says, Lord, you, you know how when you go to, go to clean your fridge out and you've got that container that's on the top shelf that you can't see real good because you're five foot six? And there's that container sitting in the back of it right there. And, and you don't dare, you don't have any idea what's even in there. And you're like, I, don't, I haven't cooked anything that resembles that in a long, long time. And so you grab that thing. And even though it's like an expensive Pyrex bowl, you throw it right in the garbage uh, because you don't want to smell what's in that thing. That's kind of what Martha's saying right here. Lord, by this time, there's going to be an odor, odor for he's been dead four days. He's already began to decompose. Lazarus's body has already began that process. It's been four days. And so I won't get all into the graphic detail here or anything like that, but between days one and three after death, uh, internal organs began to begin to decompose. Beginning on day three, usually the body begins to bloat up and things really begin to get dirty. And so some people might be quick to criticize Martha here, to criticize her unbelief. But this would be a terrible thing to see. Especially to see uh, someone in this shape that you love. This is her brother. She loves this man. Martha had indeed forgotten what Jesus told her earlier. In verse 23, as we looked at a few weeks ago, Jesus had told her, your brother will rise again. Now, Jesus didn't tell her, Martha, I'll do the best I can. He, he didn't tell her, um, I'll do everything that I can to save your brother. No, he says, Martha, your brother will rise again. But anybody who's ever buried anyone that they love, will be, we wouldn't be too quick to criticize her right here. Because we know how easily it is that our faith can break down 
when traumatic things happen. And I'll tell you one of the things that I've learned over the past few years as the pastor of this church. Look, sometimes people just need to be reminded what they believe, especially in tough times. Sometimes people just need to be reminded what it is that they believe. You'll notice that Jesus does not rebuke Martha here. People say some silly things when they're grieving the loss of a loved one. They say some weird stuff. And personally, I don't think that's the time to correct them. I don't think think that's the time to go in and to correct their beliefs or their theology or anything like that. I was in the hospital room. The first time I, I think I realized this was in 2010. My grandfather was in the hospital. He had just suffered a stroke. He would die within 10 days. And so I'm standing there. Uh, my grandfather had not passed quite uh, yet, and there's a lot of family. My mom has got five brothers, and them and all their wives. And I mean, there was a lot of people in this hospital room. And, and somebody uh, said the following. Somebody open up the window so his spirit can get out. And I thought to myself, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But I didn't say anything because the truth of the matter is, folks, we say some silly things when we're hurting. And I think it's really important for us to note here that Jesus doesn't rebuke her in that moment. Jesus gives a lesson in faith instead. And he gives us at least three things in this passage. That's the first one this morning. Jesus gives us a lesson in faith. If you just read through the New Testament, even just the Gospels themselves, you see that Jesus is always concerned with the faith of his disciples. Every time he does anything, that's what he's concerned with. He's, in, he's, he's concerned with our belief. He's concerned with our faith. In, in Matthew chapter 8, you'll remember that boat is sinking, and the disciples are just losing their mind, and Jesus would come, and he would, he would quiet the wind and the waves, but first he would say this to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? In verses 14 to 15 of the passage that we're in today, he tells his disciples before he goes to raise Lazarus. He says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, For your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. And now as he stands before the tomb, Jesus tells Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Earlier, Jesus had said this to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? I bring this up for for this point right here. For most people, seeing is believing. For most people. But, but Jesus tells Martha the opposite right here, that if she believes, she will see. Ver, again, verse 40 says, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. Now, when it comes to men and women, when it comes to us, we, we often can only trust people uh, when, we, when, we, when, when the claims that they have made after we see them do that sort of thing, right? Some guy comes up to me after church today, says, uh, I can eat 23 hot dogs in five minutes. We're going to the grocery store because he's going to have to prove that. I'm not going to believe that unless he proves that for me. Or let's say you're a boss at work or you're a supervisor or some sort of thing like that, and, and someone applies for a job. Uh, they tell you that they can do the job, and so, and so you hire them. But here's the thing, you still watch them to make sure that they can do the job correctly, don't you? It's only after we observe them doing the job correctly that we actually believe what they told us in that interview. But God's different. When it comes to God, his word is enough for us to believe him. His word is enough. That that truth, that, that all things work together for the believer's good and for God's glory, truly believe in that, it makes all the difference. I got to thinking about this this week. You know, we can endure a whole lot if we truly believe that. We can take a whole lot if we truly believe that every single thing that happens to us, as it reminds us in my favorite verse in Scripture, probably Romans 8, 28, that for everything that happens to me, because I love God, because I've been called according to His purposes, it's for my good. Everything that happens to the believer in their life is for their good and it is for the glory of God. And understanding that and truly believing that, not just giving a head nod to it, but actually believing that with your whole heart. Look, that is the only way that this mess that's going on in Afghanistan right now where Christians are being ripped out of churches and they're being killed in that moment. That's the only way that those people are still in church today. And you know, and we're, and we're quick to rag on our brothers and sisters. Um... Here, and, I, and, and I'm quick to do that too. But 
And this is just a side note. We need to be praying for those guys. But we also need to be envious of them in a way. That they've got the type of faith. Somebody will walk in that place, jerk them out of the building. They've already been threatened. They're going to see it happen. They're going to be jerked out of their churches. They're going to have their heads cut off because they're going to worship God. And we got a couple or three sprinkles of rain coming. And you can just fill in the blank. And we choose at times to not worship God. Personally, I believe the reason that they're able to go sit in those churches, they did it, I think it's eight hours ago. I can't remember the time difference. They've already had Sunday worship. Because they understand that God's got some sort of a purpose in that. That he's using that for good and that he's using that for his own glory. That, that resolve, that understanding that, God, this is not good, but you're good. And you've promised that this is just another thing that works somehow together for my good. God, get some glory out of my life. It makes all the difference in the world, church, when something bad happens to you or something bad happens to your family and you can say, this is not to hurt me. It's for the glory of my God. The doctor comes in and he tells you, I'm sorry, there's nothing else that I can do. What a difference it makes, church, when you, can, when you can sit there or stand there and you can say, that's a tough pill to swallow. But my good God is the great physician and he has prescribed it for me. He knows what he's doing. And come what may, I will trust him. That was Job's cry, wasn't it? Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Look, in, in, every, in, in, in any and every trial, if we will believe, we will see the glory of God in the way that he strengthens us to be able to endure what he has for us. Isn't that the meaning of Philippians 4.13 ultimately? The ability to endure trials in a way that glorifies God, that's not something we're born with. That's something that we have to learn. The Apostle Paul tells us that in Philippians chapter 4, doesn't he? Paul says, I've learned... How to face trials. I've learned the secret to contentment. That's what Philippians 4.13 that we take so out of context at times. And I'm not here to beat you up over that this morning. But here's what that actually says in context. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned. Not I was born with this. I was, I've learned. I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, he says, I learned again. I have learned the secret of placing of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Why is it that I can do all things through him? Because he has taught me. Because he's given me lessons in faith. Be because I've, I've, I've read this word and I continue to read this word and I take him at his word and the Holy Spirit has taught me and he continues to teach me. Number two, Jesus gives an example of faith. This one will be a little bit longer, but Jesus gives an example of faith. It seems here that for Martha, Jesus' words were enough. Right after he tells you, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God next verse? So they took away the stone. She believed and the stone was moved. And Jesus gives us an example of faith right here. Listen closely to these verses right here, 41 to 42. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Three sub points under main point number two if you're one of those outlining people. Under this, Jesus gives an example of faith. Number one, our faith must look up to God. It says that Jesus lifts up his eyes. Martha's problem was that she was looking down and that she was looking around her at her circumstances. She's looking at the carnage that is around her. Her eyes aren't, look, they're not just full of tears. Her eyes are full of her own circumstances. But, but the whole time, her eyes should have been on God. Martha had forgotten where her help comes from. Psalm 121, verses 1 to 2. This is a beautiful, beautiful psalm. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? 
You know it, church. Say it with me. My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Number two, our faith must have confidence in God. Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. What this tells us right here, when Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, Jesus has already prayed for Lazarus' resurrection. And so he approaches the tomb with confidence in God's power. And, and here's the thing, we've got to have that same confidence in prayer. We must believe what God says. We have got to take him at his word. We're not Christ. God's not given us the power to raise the dead. If he's given it to you, again, please come see me. He hasn't given us that power, but, but God has promised us multiple things in his word. He's promised that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He, he's promised that he will supply every need of ours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Number three, this one will be a little bit longer. Our faith must be a witness for God. Jesus says in verse 42, I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And so he had already told us that, that what's going on right here is so that the, that the disciples, that they'll believe, that their faith might be increased. And he says right here, these people around, he says this, I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying out loud here. And he's not doing it so that he can draw attention to himself but he does it to point to the Father. He's pointing his hearers to God while he's praying. I've got a confession to make this morning. I'm going to take a swallow of water first. It just builds up the tension in case I'm about to tell you something crazy. Every time that, uh, and one of them that invites me to do these things is here, so I, I'm going to tell you anyway. Every time I get invited to do uh, the opening prayer at the Board of Supervisors or to pray at a school board meeting or to pray for the groundbreaking of a new school or the dedication of a new area of a recreation field, I've had an opportunity to be a part of all four of those things this year. But I've got two things in mind when I go to do that. The first is obviously to talk to God. Uh, to go there and to either uh, pray for something that we do hope that he will do or to thank him for something that he already has done. And so things such as, thank you, Lord, for this new school. May it be a, pla may it be a place where you're glorified, where the students who, who know you will show the love of Christ to these children where the, uh, as they train them to, to be productive members of society, I don't know, to be good fathers, mothers, children, whatever the case might be. Or thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather uh, as members of this wonderful community. God, be glorified in our conversations and decisions that are made here this evening. Father, thank you for this new ball field. God, we pray for safety for these children. We thank you for the games. We thank you for recreation and an opportunity to be a part of such things. Now, those are all perhaps things that I have prayed this year as I've been given opportunity to lead different groups in our community in prayer. But I've also got another thing in my mind when I go to pray. I use those opportunities to preach the gospel in my prayers. Somebody over here is shaking her head because she heard me do it. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that because of Christ and his sacrifice at Calvary, that I can come before you with my petitions. That because of what Christ has done, that because that veil has been torn, I can come before you in prayer. Thank you, God, that I don't need some other man to intercede for me, but I can approach you, Father, as you sit upon your throne, and I can address you freely. Thank you, Jesus, that you were born of a virgin. Thank you, Jesus, that you lived a perfect life, which I was unable to live. Thank you, Jesus, that for dying on the cross uh, for me and for being resurrected for me and for making salvation, salvation available to anyone who will put their faith in you. Thank you, Father, uh, that you're not some false dead God like Muhammad or Allah or Buddha, but that you, my God, are alive. Jesus' prayer here, it, it, it pointed unbelievers to God. And I think mine ought to do the same. Jesus wanted everyone around him to believe that it was God who sent him and that it was God who was at work within him. We, we learn so much about faith from what happens outside of Lazarus' tomb. And as we, as we kind of come to the 
the crescendo. Maybe that's the right word. If not, Holly will fix me up later. As we meet kind of the crescendo of this story here, let's remember this. That Jesus is not just the one who gives us a lesson in faith. That he's not just the one who is a great example of faith for us. But number three, that Jesus is to be the object of our faith. I like to sit and uh, wonder as I read stuff. I, I, I wonder what the onlookers were thinking as Jesus walked up to Lazarus' tomb. You ever catch yourself wondering stuff like that? You're, you're standing around and Jesus calls for that stone to be rolled away. And then it's rolled away and he starts to pray like he does. And these are some bold claims that Jesus is making here. That God always hears him. That God had sent him. And you can just picture these folks about to open their mouths to crowd all kinds of weird mess against Jesus. You can only imagine the stuff that they're thinking. But before anybody else could say anything else, Jesus speaks again, verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. I prefer other translations for this one, not because they're better translations, I just think it sounds cooler. Lazarus, come forth. And to the call of Christ at the command of Jesus, Lazarus comes out of that tomb. Verse 44, the man who died came out. Jesus cried out, Lazarus came out. Jesus cried with a loud voice. It's an authoritative voice. It's the same voice that, that called the cosmos into being. At the very beginning of this gospel, of John's gospel, and starts in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. Our Awana kids know this verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and that without Him was nothing made that has been made. That voice that, that called Lazarus from the grave, it's the same voice that says, Moon, you go over there and don't you move until I tell you. It's the same voice that says, You, stars, go over there, planet, you go hang right there. Do you realize the power that Jesus has? Can, can you fathom just, just something of the power of his voice? John places a, a distinction here on Jesus' voice. Jesus called to Lazarus, and at the sound of his voice, that dead man came walking out of that tomb. That's a picture of how every single one of us came to Christ. It's a picture how every one of us came to Christ. The gospel is preached, or it is witnessed, or it is read, and by the call of Christ, you were raised to new life. I remember months ago as we were in John chapter 10, and we were talking a lot about shepherds and sheep, and Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Peter writes in his first letter, he says, you've been born again through the living and abiding word of God. It is the word of God that caused you to be born again. The call of Christ, it's got the power to raise the dead. Jesus, Jesus calls us out of the grave by name. It's such an awesome truth. And I'll tell you why it's awesome for someone like me. Because it means that even my feeble efforts at preaching the gospel even over my stammering or, or stuttering. I don't do it every time, but sometimes I just... Bah, 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 and y'all are hoping you hear that's all, folks, but I've got plenty more to say after that, I suppose. <laughs> but even through my feeble efforts at preaching the gospel, even over our feeble efforts at sharing the gospel sometimes, because truth is, many of us are not comfortable with it all the time. people still get saved. I read a story about a preacher last week that was on a mission trip in Uganda. He was speaking to a group of Muslims and, and he told them that uh, they needed to be forgiven of their sin. He told them that God had sent his son down the cross to pay for their sins. And so they began to ask him all sorts of questions and he did his very best to answer those questions from the word of God. 
And his question, the questions continued, and he continued to faithfully share the gospel. And so at the end, he gave an invitation like we always do. And he says, who's ready to profess faith in Christ? And one of those guys said, white man, we have already believed. We're just waiting for you to stop talking so we can tell you. What is it that makes it possible for a, for a white American speaking through uh, an interpreter to lead a group of African Muslims to Christ? Whole group. Because here's the thing, at the beginning of that conversation, before he started speaking to these guys, they were hostile to Christ, and they were hostile to Christians too. It, it's not possible simply because that man was a great persuader not just because he was a, some great preacher of the word, it was the power of God. That's what the gospel is. That's what it tells us. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Christ called these people through his word. Lazarus walking out of that tomb is a picture of every one of us that has walked out of that grave. It's a picture of every one of us that has come to Christ. We who know Jesus, we have experienced a spiritual resurrection. Look, before coming to Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That means we were spiritually dead. We had no interest in worshiping God. We had no interest in obeying God or serving God or submitting to God. But when the call of Christ, when it penetrated our hearts, we were raised to new life. In short, but God. But God is the gospel. That's what happened. I was dead, but God. If you're a Christian, you were dead, but God. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Christ called. He gave us new life. We were changed. We were made able to to hunger for his teaching. Our hearts were made able to enjoy fellowship with other believers. Our hearts were made able to, to yearn to worship God. And notice what Jesus says after Lazarus comes walking out of that tomb. Verse 44. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, up with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This teaches us something. It teaches us that after we have been raised to new life with Christ, we are no longer to go on wearing those grave clothes. That old life has got to be left behind. We've got to exchange those old grave clothes for new clothes. You can't go on living like that anymore. Paul says in Ephesians 4 that we're to put off our old selves which belongs to our former manner of life and to, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The question this morning is have you done that? Have you put on the new self? Or are you still wrapped up in those clothes that were wrapped around you? Or are you still wrapped up in those grave clothes? In closing this morning, don't use that as your, your key to close your Bible. I, I want to share something with you that kind of jumped off the page at me this week. I don't know why it is that I haven't noticed it. But don't you love that? That no matter how many times you've read this book, God shows you something else every time you read a passage. That's why I keep reading it. Well, part, part one, part A, I don't know everything that this book has to say. I haven't learned it. The Holy Spirit hasn't taught all these things to me yet. But this is what jumped off the page at me this week. There's a wonderful detail here in this story that we can't miss. Now, the new birth is a work of God. But you and I can't save people. We can't do that. And God allows me to see that truth when I preach a, uh, preach a, when I preach, I've never preached a sermon. When I preach a pitiful sermon. And somehow God has used those to save people. Or he's used them if nobody did get saved as they heard that. They, God's used them to teach someone a, 
a beautiful truth about himself or to impress that upon someone's heart. And there's probably only been two or three occasions in my life where I've preached a sermon and I've been like, you know what, that's exactly what I wanted to get across. And on those two, three, two or three occasions, you know what it's been? Crickets. Nothing. No, uh, great sermon, preacher, that's exactly what I needed today. Nothing on those two or three occasions where I actually thought that I did some good. God doesn't need me. He does not need me to preach the gospel. And he doesn't need you to do it either. He, he could have chosen to save everybody in the world without ever anybody preaching the gospel. He's God. He's allowed to do that. But I want you to notice something. Jesus did not roll that stone away himself. He told others to do it. Jesus did not unbind Lazarus himself. He didn't remove Lazarus' grave clothes that he walked out of that grave with. He didn't remove them himself. Did you notice that? He told other people to do it. There's work for us to do. Not because God needs us to do those things. Because he's God. But he delights in using people like you and me in his saving work. He loves doing that. We can't bring the dead to life, but we can bring the word to them. I love what James Montgomery Boy says. He's so much better with words than I am at times. He says, we can help remove stones. We can help remove stones of ignorance and error and despair. And after God raises them to life, we can help that new Christian by unwinding their grave clothes of doubt, fear, and discouragement. Are you willing to play a role in the saving work of Christ? Are, are you willing to, to roll gravestones and remove, remove grave clothes? It took me the whole sermon to get to the name of it, I suppose. But are you willing to do that? Are, are you prepared to, to witness and to encourage and, and to serve? Let me just tell you, there is no greater privilege on this earth. If the answer is no... My friend, I have a hard time believing that you've walked out of that tomb yourself. And so my question this morning for you is, is your faith in Christ? If not, you must respond to the Lord's calling this morning. Now, if you're new here at Oakland with us, we've had a lot of visitors lately, and praise God for that. And thank you for those of you that have been faithful in inviting your friends and folks as well. But if you're new with us here at Oakland, perhaps you're visiting, you, you're going to notice something about me. I will never, as a way of asking you if you've been saved, I will never ask you if you've walked a Nile. I will never ask you if you've prayed a prayer. I will never ask you if you've been baptized or if you've joined a church, any of those things as a way of ask, asking you if you're saved. Because none of those things save you. Those are things that saved people do. You're not saved by any of those things. You are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so is your faith in Christ this morning. If not, you must call upon the Lord Jesus. You, you must trust in him and him alone to save you. Because the fact of the matter is, folks, your good works and your righteous deeds, they will not suffice. Christ and Christ alone can save you. Maybe there's a voice ringing in your head this morning. Well, how do I know he'll receive me if I come? Because Jesus says, him who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. The Lord Jesus loves to save sinners. He's the friend of sinners. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, which is awfully good news for you and me. Will you tell him this morning? What a sinner you are and how absolutely sick of sin that you are. Will you realize and, and will you tell him that you know that you were unable to save yourself? Will you call upon his name this morning? His word says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Two part. 
got to confess with your mouth because you believe in your heart. Would you say this morning, Lord Jesus, save me? I am a wretched, hell-bound sinner, but your grace is offered to sinners just like me. And my friend, if you will call upon his name at this very moment, I can't make you many promises, and so I don't give many promises. But I can promise you on the authority of God's word that he will save you. And that he'll do it today. He'll wash your sins away. You will be clean and you will be pure. But if you turn away this free offer of the gospel, there is no hope for your soul. Today the gates of heaven are open and Jesus says, come to me, all you who are uh, weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. But one day those gates are going to be slammed shut. And you might never have this opportunity again. And so let me encourage you one last time this morning to flee to Christ. He will receive you. He will save you. He will wash you. And one day he will take you to heaven where you will spend all of eternity with him. Let's pray. In a moment, we're going to have a time of response and we're going to invite you to do whatever it is that the Lord is leading you to do this morning. If it's to come and for the first time to profess faith in Christ, we would invite you to do that. If it's to come, perhaps you've been a believer for 10 minutes or you've been one for 100 years and you've never been baptized. And you want to do that. You come and you share that decision with me this morning. If you've been visiting this church for one Sunday or for a hundred Sundays. And you want to join in membership. We would love to have you. Why don't you come and share that decision with me this morning. Maybe you just need to have prayer. You can come. You can pray with me. Or you can get down on your knees at this altar. And you can spend some time talking to the Lord. Whatever the case might be, you come as the Lord leaves. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity this morning. God, we thank you for the gospel. Father, I thank you that you have not laid the burden on me to save people. Father, because I can't. I couldn't even save myself. But God... God, we thank you for those two words, the gospel in two words. Father, impress it upon someone's heart this morning. Father, for the unbeliever this morning, grant faith, grant repentance. For the believer, Lord, give us increases in faith. Father, help us to be serious about what you've called us to do the removing of grave clothes and the rolling of gravestones. God, give us a burning desire, a passion, Lord, for the lost. But Father, in this very moment, God, I ask that you work within the lost. As we prepare to sing, Lord, um, the cry of our hearts that we need you every hour. We need you today just as much as we needed you yesterday, and we're going to need you tomorrow just the same. Father, work in this place. And we'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand.
Um, if you will, church, let me let you sit for just a moment. I've got a couple of things that I need to, to share with you. Um, a couple of uh, ladies that I need to introduce to you. You probably know them already, but uh, we, got, we do official stuff, uh, right? This is official. Um, so, uh, Janet, why don't you come stand by me uh, real quick, sister? Um, folks, this is Janet Wood. Um, she's been involved. She's been coming to Sunday school. I believe she goes to Hughes class. Um, and she's been coming to our ladies group and that sort of thing. Uh, week four last, I got to spend three hours eating cookies and chocolate-covered blueberries and drinking tea with her. And we just got to talk about our Lord and uh, what he's doing here at Oakland. And Janet has come, and she wants to be a part of our Oakland family here. Uh, she knows the Lord, and so uh, what we do, as is our custom, uh, next week uh, we'll vote. Uh, I didn't take the tractor with me last time to dig the backyard up to make sure there's nothing back there incriminating, uh, but um, we, uh, we look forward to uh, introducing her a little bit more to you and that sort of thing and for you getting to know her. So if you will, before you leave this morning, uh, let me invite you to come up and to uh, whatever you feel comfortable with, or whatever it is, uh, hugging, sla slapping fists or whatever. Y'all come and welcome her uh, this morning, but we're so glad that you're here with us, Janet. You can, yeah, you can go on where you like to. Yes, ma'am. Come on up here. Yep. And guys, uh, y'all probably know her as well, but this is Amanda Ely. This is Rob's uh, dear wife. She and her family have been coming. Rob's been a member here for, for many, many years. Uh, we baptized uh, her daughter uh, just a few months ago. Zach did, and Amanda has come this morning. She uh, knows the Lord, and she would like to be baptized and become a member of our Oakland family. So let's welcome her as well. And I have not been over there, so I'm going to dig up the backyard at Rob's house. They don't have a backyard even for me to dig right now. They're building and whatnot. Maybe a shovel. Uh. <laughs> but y'all come and welcome Amanda this morning as well. But let's welcome them once again. Amen. Um, let me uh, share with you, we'll look at some birthdays and things before we dismiss uh, this morning. But uh, Ashley Joyce has got a birthday um, the 25th, which I'm not good at math, uh, apparently, because anyway, I think that's Wednesday. So happy birthday to Ashley and Janet Dunn. Miss Janet's got one this week, so you'll want to call her and wish her well. Uh, Jimmy Henry has got one uh, coming up Saturday, I believe, and I won't dare ask how many, but happy birthday, brother. And uh, Lois Meemaw White has got one coming up as well. So happy birthday to all of you folks. Any more, uh, any more birthdays this week that I missed? Any anniversaries that I missed? Hanuxalus, when's y'all's anniversary? Thursday. Thursday, how many years? 32. 32, happy anniversary. <laughs> oh, just kidding, it is in the bulletin. I didn't miss it, I just didn't mention it, so I'm sorry. But happy anniversary to you folks. Um, let's, uh, let's stand together, and we will prepare to be dismissed. Our deacon of the week is Brother Joe Demby. He'll come close us in our benediction. Uh, let's sing the doxology, if we can, uh, as we part. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again come before you and as we finish this service today Lord we uh, know that because of what you did it was your idea to send your son Jesus Christ to die on that terrible death on that cross and then be raised on the third day he walked on this earth for 40 days after that and then ascended 
to heaven, and he's with you right now interceding for us. And Lord, even though we're not worthy, we know that you love us because you made us in your image. And Lord, I just praise you for all that you have done, and I know everyone in this room does the same thing. For because without your son, we would be lost. And as we leave this place today, I just pray that we'll all be glorifying and honoring you by what we're going to do in this next week. And that I just pray you'll give us all opportunities to be a light in this dark world and to have an opportunity to share the good news with someone else. We, I just call on you to bless us, watch over us, keep us safe until we meet again next week. And I ask this all now in Jesus' most precious name, Yeshua. Amen.